If you're up for a cold, frosty beer, try getting up on a cold, frosty morning and joining Ryan Tuckstein as he prepares a batch of his homebrew in his carport. On this edition of WSIU In Focus, we'll show you how local beer lovers are using a variety of different methods to make their distinctly individual home brews. They all use pretty much the same basic process and ingredients, but the resulting varieties of beer are almost endless. Sam Davis has built a high-tech system to prepare his mash, while Marika Josephson uses a basic approach and instead focuses on unique ingredients. We'll also meet Matt McCarroll, who sees a market for locally produced ingredients and has started growing hops for local brewers. This explosion of creativity, skill, and enthusiasm has spawned a club that invites people to taste their awesomeness. Many club members hope to follow in the footsteps of the region's growing number of wineries to eventually form their own beer path that complements the area's successful wine trail. To appreciate beer, it helps to learn how it's made. The slightest variances in the process and ingredients can yield a totally different product. Our local home brewers are happy to introduce you to beer making and show you how this homegrown approach may lead to the next big thing for both the brewers and for our region's tourism economy. It's mid-February and Ryan Tockstein is getting ready to brew a batch of beer. This is something he does every couple of weeks throughout the year because he's developed a passion for better beer. I went to college uh, in Edwardsville and worked at a grocery store there and discovered that there was beer that was enjoyable. Then I realized that uh, it was actually Cheers. legal to brew your own beer. I'm going to be brewing a Northern English Ale today. This process will take uh, maybe five to six hours, so we're getting started early. I graduated and moved down uh, here to Benton, Illinois. And what I'm doing now is I want to heat up my water uh, to about 165 degrees to get ready for the mash. I didn't know anybody that brewed down here. I didn't know anybody that really enjoyed craft beer like I do. So it really felt like I was, you know, alone in my mission of, of uh, spreading the word about good craft beer and home brewing. But Ryan Tockstein was not alone. There were others here just like him, and they all had similar stories. I started home brewing when I moved to Carbondale. I'd been living in New York, um, where I'd been for about five years. I'd been drinking a lot of beer in New York, and I wanted to drink a lot of the different styles that I'd been drinking there. So I started brewing beer just so that I could drink the styles that I was drinking when I was able to have access to all the beer in the world. And then I happened upon Kindling uh, in Carterville, Illinois. This is one of the haunts of Sean Connolly, a local beer expert known as the Beer Philosopher. Uh, the Beer Philosopher blog is what uh, eventually parlayed into uh, my writing for Beer Connoisseur magazine, where the Beer Connoisseur comes from. Um, that's actually a national magazine based out of Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I'm their style writer. Beer is every bit as complex as wine, and there are, you know, myriad beer styles, as far as recognized beer styles, well over 120 styles, um, and then sub-styles under that. So there's really a lot in the world beer portfolio uh, that most people, I would say most people, a lot of people don't know or recognize. So, you know, a big part of what I enjoy doing is, is allowing people to see a little bit more of that world and expand their, their horizons and try beers that they haven't before. I'm so glad that Sean can represent our area. He's done so much to, to promote better beer, um, you know, craft beer in this area. Conley holds weekly tasting events and these attract local brewers. But what it proved to be was an opportunity for people who were brewing their own beer locally to bring their beer in and let other beer drinkers try their beer. It seems as the time went, I started to meet more and more home brewers and thought it would be a great, great idea if we had a club of our own where we could network and learn from each other and enjoy brewing a little bit more because it's always more fun to brew with somebody. I got into the state yesterday at about 4.30 from California. We drove direct from Southern California 
And uh, I found out about this meeting by way of my father-in-law, who has been here since the first meeting, this being the third one. Um, and we found out that it was happening today, and we definitely couldn't miss it. This meeting of the Southern Illinois Brewers is hosted by Sam Davis, who, like other club members, is eager to share what he's doing. I've been brewing for 10 years, around about 10 years. Um, I brewed with, ex brewing with extracts, and that worked out pretty well. And only about a couple years ago did I switch over to all grain. Like Sam Davis, club president Ryan Tockstein brews using the all grain method, which begins by heating water that's used to make a mash. Actually going up to 170. A mesh is sort of like a tea made from barley malts. The all grain approach gives him control over one of the key components that determine the style and flavor of his brew, the mixture of grains. We have uh, crushed grain, so we have uh, nine pounds of the uh, base malt. That is uh, American uh, pale ale. That is the very light colored barley here. So I'll use all of this grain. Um, I calculated this recipe to where I would yield um, five, about five gallons of beer at a, uh, a specific uh, alcohol percentage. Um, so I've got nine pounds of, of pale ale malt and a half pound of crystal 60 and a quarter pound of chocolate and a half pound of victory malt. Um, <clears throat> so in all, I've got uh, 10 and a quarter pounds of malt. These kernels of barley have been malted. This means they've been allowed to begin to germinate, and then they're dried. The specialty malts are usually roasted in a kiln. And whenever you kiln them, you caramelize some of those sugars. They will give your beer a, uh, a sweeter flavor, and they will also contribute uh, a bit of head retention to your beer as well. And the kiln malts also give color to your beer. Heating the water to the optimal temperature for steeping out starches and flavors is a critical part of the brewing process. Ah, the water is slightly high. It's about 172 degrees, but that's okay. Um, two degrees is okay with me. So what I will do is I'll pour my 172 degree water into my mash tun and let it heat up the mash tun a little bit. That way the temperature of the water inside will decrease slightly. So this is what I call my mash tun. And you can see it's just a five gallon um, beverage cooler that I've retrofitted with a ball valve. And I've also bought what you'd call a false bottom which I can remove and show you what it is. It is just a uh, stainless steel perforated dome, which has a, uh, <clears throat> a tube coming uh, off of the top of it, which connects to my ball valve. This is what the grain rests on top of. There is a lot of variance in the kind of tunes that people use and how elaborately they are constructed. I am not an engineer and um, I've been living on a student budget for the last seven years, so um, I tried to do the cheapest thing I possibly could that uh, required next to no skill whatsoever. So I got two bottling buckets. Um, this is what you use to bottle. You just put the beer in here and it'll come out the spigot. Um, in order to make my mash tun, I just got another bottling bucket and I drilled by hand, I don't know, probably 300 holes in here. Um, I just take that bucket and I slide it in here, put the grains in, and then uh, add the water to start the mash. And once it's all in there, I wrap it with this uh, insulation here so it looks like a space object, basically. So some people won't use the false bottom that I showed you. They'll build their own system of little pipes that have holes in it, which uh, filter your work from the grain. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, put my grain into my uh, mash water. And this is what we call doughing in. Uh, pouring 10 and a quarter pounds of grain into a uh, cooler is not an easy task. Tuckstein stirs the mash to get it immersed in the water and adds a thermometer to monitor his temperature. What I was shooting for was 153 degrees, so 
after a couple minutes and that thermometer has stopped increasing in temperature, we'll check it and see how good I really am. Okay, I want to check my mash temperature and see if I hit my mark, which, let's see, that's 152. So pretty close, 152 degrees. Before, this is what I mashed in. Keeping his temperature absolutely consistent was so important for Sam Davis, he built a HERMS unit, which is short for Heat Exchanged Recirculating Mash System. So I upgraded my mash ton to this. Uh, my mash, my grain, my water is all in here. Right now we're doing a 10 gallon batch with uh, 8.3 gallons of water and around about 25 pounds of grain. Um, inside here I've got a false bottom which keeps um, my grain from going through my system. Um, it comes out of here into the pump and into here into a, a 50, I've got a 50 foot copper coil uh, doing a heat exchange and inside I've got a 5500 watt heating like water heater element. That's my source of heat. This is uh, the output of the coil. So it's been heated and now it's being transferred back on top of the grain bed. A controller monitors temperature sensors. If there's the slightest variance, the heater kicks on. He couldn't find how to build this system from a single source. Most of it was done by guesswork. I don't think there's really any books out there that really explains how to build one of these. I knew I wanted one of these systems really bad. I like, you know, the fact of controlling your mash temperatures. I just built my system to get the job done. <laughs> I've definitely had some, some beers that keep their temperature better than others. Sometimes it won't drop more than a degree, and sometimes it drops six or seven degrees. I can't explain it. I have no idea why it happens. I'm sure it's because it's not the uh, most efficient uh, setup in the world, but I haven't had any real problems with the beers that I've brewed with it, and I've won some awards, so I guess it seems to be working pretty well. Sam Davis's quest to control his mashing temperature illustrates one direction where a home brewer is using ingenuity to improve the quality and consistency of his product. But a simple, inexpensive mashing system can still yield great results. What's important is that during the mashing process, the hot water steeps in the grain for a specific amount of time at close to a specific temperature. So we've only dropped um, maybe two degrees at the most over an hour, so that's good. Pretty consistent mash temperature. In about an hour or so, the liquid called wort is ready to be drained. At first, it comes out of the tune with little bits of grain that got through the false bottom. But what we'll do is we'll pour this wort back into the top of our mash and we'll do this a few times. What ends up happening is the husks and uh, the grain itself will filter itself, it will filter the wort. So you're creating a nice uh, filter down there with the grain, and that's what you call the grain bed. The wort with particles is poured back into the tune. Ryan Tockstein uses a strainer, not to strain the wort, but to slow it down and make sure the grain bed is not disturbed so it can work as the filter. This whole process may seem like a hassle. In fact, you can buy wort that's pre-made. Controlling exactly how the wort is made, though, is what distinguishes all grain brewers from extract brewers. I enjoy brewing all grain because you have a little bit more control over your finished product. You get to tailor it to your specifications. Um, if you are an extract brewer, um, the extract being wort that has been made by a company and dehydrated into a syrupy substance, um, you will use that, uh, dissolve it into water, and that's your wort. Next, the wort needs to go through a process called a boil, which serves many functions. Part of the reason why we boil the wort is because we want to denature a lot of the proteins and get them to settle out of the wort um, so it doesn't create clarity problems. And we are boiling. The other function of the boil is that this is when the other key flavor component of beer, hops, is added. Whenever you add hops at certain times during the boil, it will either uh, make your beer bitter or it will, um, it will give 
certain hop flavors to your beer. Because he is making an English style of brown ale, Tuckstein is using English varieties of hops. Uh, we're actually doing a 65 minute boil, so I'm going to throw these hops in uh, at 65 minutes. These are Kent Golding uh, pellet hops. Um, they give the uh, beer a, a nice, uh, clean, bittering flavor. And just add them directly to the boil. Then at about 45 minutes, I'll add a half ounce of Fuggle hops. Um, they're also an English hop. And at five minutes, I will add the other half ounce of the Fuggle hops. Originally grown as a decorative vine in Germany, dozens of varieties of hops are cultivated today as a flavoring agent. While always bitter, different varieties of hops are described as grassy, floral, or citrusy. Most of the world's hops production is still done in Europe, but hops are also being cultivated in America. In fact, home brewers like Matt McCarroll and his wife Jan are growing hops locally. We started growing hops about two years ago, um, looking at something to do with our property, um, looked into growing different crops. I've been a brewer for a long time, and so we decided to try growing hops at a small commercial scale and just to see how things are going. And so last year we did pretty well. Um, hops take about three years before you get into full production, and so this is our second year with, with these hops here. <clears throat> so these are Cascade hops, and um, the oils that we use in brewing are basically on the inside. You can see little, I don't know if you can see the little yellow oil sacs there. Those are the lupulin glands that have the oils, and that's what we want to get for the bittering and the aroma agents in the hops. The first season, we, we sold almost exclusively to home brewers in the local area. People are real interested in having things local, and so I think just the, uh, the idea of having a beer that's brewed from local ingredients is, is, is really attractive to people, and I think that's you know, why we were able to, to sell our hops so quickly here. Matt McCarroll sells his hops at events such as the Big Muddy Beer Festival and also sells hops and beer making supplies at his home. Here, Marika Josephson is using some local hops she got from Windy Hill Farm. She really appreciates being able to use a locally grown product. I bought Mountain Jen's hops and put it in my beer. It's as good as anything else that you can get anywhere else. Um, I really wish that, especially because this is such a, a ripe area for agriculture, that more people were um, making the product that we want to put in our beer. In some cases, the product Marika Josephson puts in her beer isn't even cultivated, but grows in abundance locally. This is a pound of dandelions that I picked uh, at home. This is all going into the beer as the bittering ingredient um, in place of what would be hops in a normal beer. A lot of people, when they make dandelion wine, for example, they'll just use the, the flour. Uh, because the flower is the only part of the plant that's not bitter. So we're getting a little bit of this kind of flowery character in the beer, but for the most part we're getting all of the bitter, the bitterness that's in the rest of the plant. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in um, old techniques that people had before they had these massive stainless steel tanks and um, that they, you know, can keep their fermentation temperatures within a half a degree. I'm kind of more interested in what people did when they, they didn't have those, these newfangled devices. So I think it's pretty cool that you can uh, brew with dandelions and, and make a really great tasting beer. The, the dandelion beer was a, a real uh, success at the St. Louis Heritage Festival. I heard a lot of really positive comments about it. People thought it was unique uh, to have dandelion in the beer and actually really enjoyed the taste of it. We heard lots of comments like, you know, where can I buy this? and um, you know, I think people really enjoyed. Uh, often the often the uh, homebrew tent is the more kind of experimental tent. The more experimental beers homebrewers are doing all kinds of different things, and um, you get beers that are really different from what you're tasting at, at other breweries. There is no lack of creativity when it comes to home brewing. We see this in both the ingredients and in the types of brewing accessories people use. For example, Ryan Tuckstein uses a fancy chiller system to cool his wort down to about 75 degrees following the boil. Marika Josephson uses a simple homemade copper coil. Here she is placing it in the boiling wort to sanitize it. In both cases, they use cool water flowing through a heat exchanger to speed up the cooling process so that they can add yeast to their wort. 
So you want to spread the yeast out over the surface of the wort as evenly as possible. Ryan Tockstein ferments his ale in a pail, while Marika Josephson uses a clear jug called a carboy as her fermentation chamber. Both like to use their bathrooms as part of their brewery. This is my uh, downstairs bathroom. <laughs> um, it's the room in our house that stays the most stable temperature and stays the coolest. It's about 64 in here. It's been fermenting for about two days and it's in the high Krausen stage so the yeast are multiplying and they're starting to eat the sugars. It's a really simple setup. I just have this plastic uh, synthetic uh, carboy here. Um, this bung sits in the top of the carboy and then the airlock uh, in that with sanitizing solution inside. When the yeast first starts working at the very beginning of the fermentation, it is possible to have a little explosion, uh, which has happened to me once or twice. Um, the yeast is so vigorous that this Krausen gets basically so big that it fills up this entire area here. And if you're not careful and you have this airlock in, it can fill the airlock and jam it. And you're creating so much pressure with the CO2 that it'll just shoot this thing up into the ceiling and spray beer everywhere. Those accidents are rare, but Josephson's constant brewing at her small home presents her with an ongoing problem, where to put all the carboys that she has fermenting. Started fermenting, as you can see, the bubbles are coming up. My boyfriend thinks it's crazy that I have stuff all over the place, and uh, he never ceases to find amusement uh, in telling people where I have beer stored all over the house. <laughs> A week after he began the fermentation of his brown ale, Ryan Tockstein's brew was finished fermenting. So we'll take the lid off and hope that we don't see any mold or any other kind of <laughs> growth on the beer. Uh, we're going to use our uh, hydrometer to take a gravity reading, and this will tell us two things. It will tell us if our beer is done fermenting, and it will also tell us um, roughly how much alcohol is in the beer. We started out at a 1.052 uh, specific gravity reading and now we're at about a 1.01. Uh, so we have roughly about 5% uh, of that as alcohol. Whenever the beer ferments, it will uh, create what is uh, called a crossin and it's a very dense foam of, of yeast and, and proteins and, and hop particles that are kind of on the top of the beer. And then whenever the fermentation subsides, it will leave the, uh, some of those proteins and, and uh, a little bit of the yeast and some of the hot particles on the edges of your fermenter. Um, and that's good, it sticks to the sides of the fermenter because if you uh, knock that stuff back in or leave it in the beer, then it can create harsh flavors. The yeast will drop out of the beer so you can see how clear the uh, beer is already. Um, and this is just one week after uh, pitching the yeast, so it uh, does its job very quickly. Ryan Tuckstein uses a siphon to avoid the particles on the side of the pail or picking up the spent yeast from the bottom. He drains his ale directly into a keg. You may have noticed that his fermented ale is not carbonated. Just like soda pop, his keg beer will get its carbonation from his dispensing system. These old five gallon soda fountain containers are extremely popular with home brewers the Southern Illinois Brewers had several of these kegs running as they invited the public to come taste their awesomeness. And it was just amazing. People had a huge interest in the types of beers and the homebrewed beers that were there. And, you know, hands down, they were some of the most unique beers that uh, we featured at the festival. You know, several of those beers were as good, if not better, than most commercially available beers uh, that I've had. And oftentimes these people who brew these beers have aspiration to brew commercially at some point. Ryan um, and Aaron and I have been working on um, trying to start a brew pub. The same thing that you can do with wine, you can do with beer here. You can grow hops, you can grow barley. You can make a beer that's distinctly Southern Illinoisan. We're doing some experimental work with some locally grown um, barley that we're doing as an experimental batch. Um, but people are real interested in having things local and so I think just the, uh, the idea of having a beer that's brewed from local ingredients is, is, is really attractive to people. Coming back here and what's going on now in Southern Illinois is amazing. The, the wine trail, the new wineries that are there, and now uh, there's a groundswell of brewing that is obviously happening here. 
spent the last 10 years wondering why we don't have any breweries in the area. And I think that the answer is that we're really primed to see that take off. Um, you hear lots of rumors here and there, but I, I, I know of several people that are looking at and have actually made um, official processes for getting breweries started. So I think we're going to see that happen. We've kind of joked around but came up with, with the idea and coined the phrase of a Southern Illinois beer path that's complementary to the Southern Illinois wine trail. I can think of uh, half a dozen people off the top of my head who are really invested in starting a brewery who make very good beer and in the next five years I think we'll have a real brewing community here, um, you know, kind of a, a, a beer path kind of like the wine trail. Um, where people will be able to go and, and taste a lot of different beers by some very, very high quality brewers. Now, we couldn't fit in every last detail in our story, like how bottled beer gets its carbonation, but that kind of information is readily available in books and on the internet. You might say, we just wanted to whet your appetite, so to speak. And to let you know that some of your neighbors could be brewing up the area's newest industry. So join us next week as we serve up another round of local flavor here on WSIU In Focus. Video copies of this program are available. To order, call our customer service department at 618-453-6184.